Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of Sony's RX100 Mark 7, the latest in a long line of best selling compact cameras. The Mark 7 inherits the body of its predecessor with its 8.3x zoom, flip screen, and pop up viewfinder, but now sports a faster sensor with Sony's latest autofocus for A9 style performance in your pocket, improves movie stabilization, allows potentially long 4K clips, and becomes the second model in its class to add a microphone input. Take that, Canon G7X Mark III. This kind of high-end performance does come at an equally high-end price though of around $1200 US dollars or pounds, which may be the same as the Mark VI launch price a year before, but remains comfortably more expensive than its rivals. Speaking of which, I shot with the RX100 Mark VII directly alongside the Canon G5X Mark II and G7X Mark III, allowing me to compare them side by side, and in this video I'll help you choose between them. In your hands, the RX100 Mark VII looks and feels pretty much identical to the model before it. As such, it's an impressively compact camera considering the zoom housed within it. Like previous models, the flush dials and smooth front allow it to slip more easily into pockets, but also make it harder and more slippery to hold than Canon's latest PowerShot G cameras, which sport small but comfortable grips, not to mention more tactile buttons. All three cameras feature customizable lens control rings, but while Sony's turn smoothly with no feedback between steps, Canon's opted for clicked only versions now on its G7X Mark III and G5X Mark II. Note how the two Canons are actually a little bit different in this regard. For size reference, here's the RX100 Mark VII in the middle, flanked by the Canon G5X Mark II on the left and the Canon G7X Mark III on the right. Both Canons are a little larger all round, but again, what you sacrifice in ultimate pocketability, you gain in comfort in your hands. That said, you can fit third party grips for the RX100 series if you want more to hold on to. As before, the screen can angle down by 90 degrees and up by 180 degrees to face the subject for selfies or vlogging. Both Canons can also flip their screens up by 180 degrees, but only down by around 45 or even a bit less, and Sony's articulation also lets you pull its screen completely away from the body, improving airflow and cooling. Amazingly, Sony only started fitting touchscreens to the RX100 series from the Mark VI onwards, and it's still underused here, sadly. So while you can tap to reposition the autofocus area or pull focus during movies, you still can't tap your way through the function menu, or scroll through the main menu, nor even swipe through images in playback. You can double tap to enlarge in playback before pushing the image around, but this limited functionality falls behind the full tappable user interface of the Canons, not to mention pretty much everyone else. The RX100 Mark VII is equipped with the same one-touch pop-up viewfinder as its predecessor, delivering a small but detailed view from its OLED panel. The one-touch mechanism, originally debuted on the RX1R and borrowed on the RX100 Mark VI, is really handy, letting you pop it up and push it back down again in a single motion. Contrast that with the viewfinder on the Canon G5X Mark II, which shares the two-stage process of the RX100 Marks III to V, which needed to be popped up and pulled out before being pushed back and down again. It's slow and less convenient in practice, and you can also choose on the Sony whether popping up the viewfinder and down again powers the camera on or off, or not. The Sony RX100 Mark VII inherits the micro HDMI and micro USB ports of earlier models, so unlike Canon, it's resisted the chance to fit a USB-C port here. But in a very, very welcome upgrade, it joins the G7X Mark III in becoming one of the only compacts in its class to offer a 3.5mm microphone input, allowing a potential upgrade in your movie sound quality. This is big news for anyone who vlogs or shoots any kind of video, and I'm going to show you some examples in a few minutes. Since the RX100 series lost its hot shoe several generations ago in order to accommodate a pop-up viewfinder and 180 degree flip-up screen, you'll need to be a bit creative about mounting an external microphone. I used a V-shaped bracket here with two accessory shoes allowing me to slide on a Rode shotgun mic here alongside the RX100 Mark VII on a mini ball head. Here's another configuration with the Rode Wireless Go receiver unit, which could arguably also be held onto the camera with an elastic band if you're really desperate. But like the G7X Mark III, you could alternatively just connect a wired lav mic. The RX100 Mark VII is powered by the same battery pack as before, that's good for around 200 shots or around an hour's worth of 4K video. As before, it's charged inside the camera over USB, and so long as there's a trace of charge in the pack, you can also power the camera for actual use over USB. And that could also be using a portable power bank if you like. 
The lens remains the big selling point of the RX100 Mark 7, inheriting the 8.3x zoom introduced on the Mark 6 for a 24-200mm equivalent range. So it starts at the same wide angle as the earlier RX100s and its two Canon rivals, but reaches much longer, giving it much greater flexibility, especially for sports, action and all-round travel use. For comparison, here's the Canon G7X Mark III filming in 4K and zooming from 24mm to its maximum equivalent of 100mm. Next, here's the Canon G5X Mark II, again starting at 24mm before extending to its now slightly longer maximum of 120mm. Now here's the RX100 Mark 7 starting at 24mm, looking a tad tighter than the Canons here due to the minor crop incurred when filming 4K, before extending way beyond both of them to its maximum of 200mm. Now note, there's no crop when shooting still photos or 1080p video where all three of these cameras start with exactly the same wide angle coverage. So bigger is better, right? Well, not for everything. In order to pack the big zoom into the small body, the RX100 7's lens inevitably becomes dimmer than its shorter zoomed rivals, with a maximum aperture of f2.8 at the wide end, quickly slowing to f4 at 40mm and finally to f4.5 from 109mm onwards. This makes it around one stop slower than the G7X Mark III and G5X Mark II, not to mention Sony's own RX100 Mark V in their shared 24-70mm-ish ranges. This in turn means the RX100 Mark 7 has to deploy higher ISO sensitivities under the same conditions while also having a greater depth of field or rather less chance of blurring in the background. The Mark 7 also lacks the built-in neutral density filter of those other models which is invaluable for achieving those slow motion friendly shutter speeds that are ideal for video without closing the aperture down too much. So what can you expect in practice? Here's a portrait of me taken with the Canon G7X Mark III at 100mm f2.8. And now one with the G5X Mark II at 120mm f2.8. Now here's the RX100 Mark VII also zoomed to around 120mm to match the G5X II, but using its dimmer maximum aperture of f4.5. And if you look closely, you can see there is a small but visible difference in the depth of field, the blurring in the background. Now this isn't quite the whole story though, as if you can step back a bit further, you can shoot zoomed in longer at 200mm f4.5 and get this result with the Sony. Although the two Canons are still managing slightly greater blurring in the background, as well as using lower ISOs. And to my eyes, I think they're delivering better looking colours here in this indoor lighting example. Which of these four examples do you like best? Now for a macro example with all three cameras close to their minimum focusing distances. First the Canon G7X Mark III at 24mm f1.8, followed by the Canon G5X Mark II, again at 24mm f1.8, and now by the Sony RX100 Mark VII at 24mm f2.8, that's the maximum aperture at its wide angle. Look closely at all three side by side and there is a small benefit to the Canons, although perhaps not by as much as you'd think. The bigger impact really is the ability to use a lower ISO than the Sony for potentially better image quality. Sony's equipped the RX100 Mark VII with a new stacked CMOS sensor that may have the same 20 megapixel resolution as before, but now boasts faster readout and a slightly higher number of autofocus points embedding 357 points over 68% of the frame versus 315 over 65% of the frame on the Mark 5 and 6. That doesn't really make a great deal of difference. What makes a much bigger difference though is the updated autofocus algorithms as I'll show in just a moment. But first, let's see how the single autofocus performance measures up. In this test, I'm focusing between near and far using a single AF area on the RX100 Mark 7. Here, the camera uses a combination of phase and contrast detect autofocus and gets the job done pretty quickly and effectively. Now for the Canon G7X Mark III which uses contrast based autofocus only and while there's inevitably some hunting at each end as a consequence it's still fairly swift. But the real differences between these cameras comes with continuous autofocus and burst shooting. First, here's the Sony RX100 Mark 7 showing off its face and eye detection, updated to Sony's latest versions, easily tracking me across the frame before then firing off bursts at up to 20 frames per second with zero blackout. 
Sure, the Mark V and Mark VI may have offered even faster 24 frames per second bursts, but with blackout between frames. Now, the Mark VII delivers an almost mini A9-like experience. Now for comparison, here's the Canon G5X Mark II, which like the G7X Mark III uses contrast-based autofocus only, and annoyingly doesn't let you select face detection when using continuous servo AF. So in this test, I'm limited to a single autofocus point, which means when I'm not under it, it won't focus on me. Plus the burst speed is not only much slower here, but even in its slower so-called tracking speed, it's still failing to keep up with my movements. Sony is a clear winner by a mile here, but the big question you need to ask yourself is whether you actually need this performance in practice. With the latest autofocus software, the Mark 7 goes beyond just human eye detection to also offer animal eye detection. Here's Chester, relaxing in the heat, and now here's Henry, demonstrating the continuous doggy eye detect in Bison Beer. It works with other animals too, not just dash ones. The Sony is also perfectly at home capturing faster moving subjects such as Ben cycling towards me here at 200mm f4.5 and at 20 frames per second. Sure, the depth of field isn't that challenging on this camera, but the Sony simply does so much better than both of the Canons in this regard when it comes to sports, action and wildlife, and that includes active kids and pets. It reaches further and effectively focuses on moving subjects wherever they are in the frame. New to the RX100 Mark 7 and presumably other upcoming Sony cameras is an even higher single burst mode. It's not like anyone that complained the previous Sonys were too slow, but now you can fire off a 7 frame burst at up to 90 frames per second using the full resolution. The challenge is finding something that actually moves fast enough to justify it and making sure your timing is spot on to grab it. My best success was with an old fashioned splash, although again I had to try it several times with the extremely narrow window of capture. It's fun, but I'd have found a pre-buffering mode more useful, even at a much slower burst speed, especially for birds taking flight, and that is a feature that's offered on the latest Canons. Now for a selection of photos I took with the RX100 Mark 7 around New York and back at home in Brighton. Like the RX100 6 before it, I loved having the long zoom at my disposal, capturing the usual wide shots at one moment, but then being able to grab really distant or small details at the next. Long zoom compacts aren't anything new as Panasonic has long offered them with its Lumix TZ or ZS series, but while the Sony lens is shorter than its Lumix rivals, it's optically brighter and in my tests delivered crisper results too, especially at the long end. The maximum aperture does become a disadvantage on the Sony in low light, forcing the Mark 7 to use higher ISOs than its shorter zoom rivals, and if you mostly shoot or film in low light, you should probably go for one of those models instead. But if you mostly shoot outdoors, you'll absolutely love the longer range, not to mention the stability when using the viewfinder. It really is a perfect camera for travel. The RX100 Mark 7 is also a very capable movie camera, filming 1080 video at 24 to 120p, all with sound and autofocus even at the highest frame rate, as well as 4K video at 24, 25 or 30p, depending on what setting you've got the region set to. Note while high frame rate 1080 video is now also available on the Canon G5X2 and G7X3, they do so without autofocus or sound. And while there's also 4K on the new Canons, uncropped too, they lack 24p at any video resolution. To compare the quality in 1080p, here's the Sony RX107 in the top half of the screen, and the Canon G5X Mark II in the bottom half. Note here the Sony was filming 24p versus 25 on the Canon. Now to compare them in 4K, again with the Sony RX107 in the top half and the Canon G5X Mark II in the bottom half, and again filmed in 24 and 25p respectively. I adjusted the lens on the Sony here to deliver the same field of view as it crops very slightly when filming in 4K. Now for some clips filmed with the Sony RX100 Mark 7 using its high frame rate 1080 mode, here set to 100p for the power region, so delivering a 4 times slowdown on my 25p timeline. Again, what makes the Sony's high frame rate 1080 better than most rivals is the fact it works with continuous autofocus and records sound too, allowing you to use the clips at normal speed if you like, with the option for a 4 or 5 times slowdown if necessary. If you want even slower still, there's the HFR mode, which can shoot at 250, 500 or 1000 frames per second in power regions, for potential slowdowns of 10, 20 or 40 times on my 25p timeline, albeit without sound or autofocus and with progressively lower quality as the frame rate increases. 
Here's that splash again in the 250 frames per second HFR mode, playing back here 10 times slower than normal. Now here it is at 500 frames per second, playing back 20 times slower, and you can see a reduction in quality. And finally at 1000 frames per second where there's a crop and a further reduction in quality, but still 40 times slow motion from a pocket camera is really impressive, and the 250 frames per second mode delivers almost 1080 quality. The phase detect autofocus system means the Sony can easily keep the subject sharp. Here I'm using the touch screen to pull focus between the can and the background. The Mark 7 also gains eye detection for movies, and while the inherently large depth of field on this particular camera means this isn't as big a deal as it is on larger formats, there's simply no denying the fact that it can effortlessly track a face as it approaches or moves around the frame. This is something which the Canons really struggle with. It even works reasonably well tracking video at higher speeds, such as Ben here, again cycling towards me at 200mm f4.5. This all makes it ideal for vlogging, so without further ado, it's time to bother the workers and tourists in the lanes of Brighton. Hello, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is a quick vlogging test with the Sony RX100 Mark 7. Yes, Mark 7, can you believe we're on the seventh generation already? And yet we're still getting some new features that some of us requested rather a long time ago. Now, while the longer zoom range of this camera has made it more appealing to, well, travel photographers, general all-round use, it's still a compelling option for vloggers, as I hope to show you in this sequence of clips. Now, I'm starting off filming 1080 at 25p using the standard image stabilizer and I've also set the creative style to neutral because I feel that the standard one is a little bit too vibrant when you're filming faces or skin tones. But now let's run through the stabilization settings. Okay, still filming in 1080 at 25p, but now with the stabilization set to active, so hopefully this should be more effective than before. Now let's try an even more powerful setting. Now still in 1080 at 25 people using the intelligent active mode. This is the strongest stabilization that is available when you're filming 1080 video. Now I should also mention that I have the camera set to wide area autofocus with face and eye detection. Eye detection is new to the Mark 7. But enough of 1080, let's see what this thing looks like in 4K. Okay, now I've switched to 4K, filming in 25p. Can you see a step up in detail? Maybe you need a bigger screen or a high resolution display to see it. I can really notice it in uh, my beard. The detail in there looks to me more, well, there's greater, finer detail than there is at 1080, but your mileage may vary. And again, it really does depend on where and how you're viewing it. Now, again, I keep saying I'm filming this at 25p, so let's talk about the exposure. I have the camera set to manual exposure mode at a shutter speed of a 50th of a second, and I'm using the lens zoom to its widest setting and its maximum aperture of f2.8. Now, unfortunately, the RX100 Mark 7 inherits exactly the same lens as the Mark 6. That gives it a fantastic zoom range and it's great quality, but it does mean it's a little bit slower than the Mark 5 models and also Canon's latest power shot. So it's f2.8 maximum at its wide end compared to f1.8 on the Canon's and the RX100 Mark 5. It means you're not gonna get as much blurring in the background. And also it doesn't have the built-in ND filter of the Mark V or the Canons, which means in bright conditions, it can be harder to deploy those slower shutter speeds, at least with the large apertures. But since I'm filming indoors at the moment, I am managing to shoot at 50th of a second. So the motion should look all right. Now let's increase the stabilization. Still filming in 4K at 25p, but now with active steady shot enabled. This is a new feature on the Mark 7. Now, the previous models uh, could only do standard stabilization when filming in 4K, and I found it was a little bit wobbly when you're trying to walk with it like I'm doing now. It was a feature where the Sonys were outperformed by some of their rivals, particularly Canon. However, with the Mark 7, Sony's now improved the 4K stabilization with active steady shot. It doesn't go as far as to offer the intelligence active steady shot in 1080 but I'd say it's a big improvement over what you saw in the previous clip what do you think but there's one even bigger improvement yet to happen and that involves the audio because so far I've been using the built-in microphones but this camera becomes one of the first to feature a three and a half millimeter microphone input okay still filming in 4k at 25p still using active steady shot but now using an external microphone connected to the 3.5 millimeter 
input on the side of the camera. Now, the RX100 Mark VII becomes one of the only compact cameras in its class to offer this facility, the other one being Canon's PowerShot G7X Mark III, coincidentally only announced a few weeks before this one. Now there are two one-inch class compacts aimed at vloggers which have microphone inputs. And I've got a Rode VideoMic Pro, that's an older shotgun microphone connected to the camera. I'm gonna show you what it's like with a lav mic in just a moment. Um, you do need to adjust your recording levels. I've uh, turned them quite a bit down here, so hopefully I'm not saturating. You do need to be careful with that, especially with uh, the wireless microphone system that I'm gonna use. But it really does offer you a bit of an upgrade, potentially a big upgrade in sound quality. Now I'm gonna show you what it sounds like with a different microphone. Okay, still filming in 4K at 25p, but I've switched to the Rode Wireless Go, which is a wireless microphone system. You can see I've attached the transmitter unit here onto my collar because uh, the transmitter actually has its own built-in lav microphone. You can connect your own lav if you like and stick it in your back pocket, the uh, transmitter unit, but you can use it as I am here as a microphone and transmitter. And if you're interested in this microphone system, I have a separate detailed review of it, comparing it to lots of different microphones. The one gotcha though that you do have to watch out for is that the output level on it is very high. So you'll really need to turn your recording levels down. I have the uh, wireless go set to its uh, medium volume output and I have the RX100 Mark VII set to just a recording level of just four. So really, really low, but hopefully it sounds okay and it gives you an idea of what two different microphones sound like in this environment. But you may well be asking yourself, Gordon, I ask you this question, how are you connecting these microphones, actually physically connecting them to the camera? Because of course, this does not have an accessory shoe of any description on it. And if it did have one on the top, well, the screen folding over the top would block it. So it would be pretty useless. So what you'll need to do is be a little bit creative. I've got a, a kind of old Y-shaped or V-shaped bracket, which has got two accessory shoes on it. So I have the microphone or the uh, transmitter unit or the receiver rather connected to one of those mounted on one of those and on the other one I've got a small ball head on which I've got the camera and I've just got a mini tripod underneath there which I'm using to hold the whole rig it looks a bit funny and I'm getting more funny looks than normal but I'm not complaining because you know we have been asking for microphone inputs on these cameras for ages and it wasn't like they were going to be able to fit an accessory shoe on something this small so you are going to have to get creative use some sort of bracket like I'm doing or of course you could use some sort of wired lav microphone actually connect that wire straight into the side of the camera feed it up your shirt and clip it on your collar or your lapel that would work really really well anyway that's it for this uh, section of the review I hope you found it useful if you're thinking to yourself, that's all very well, Gordon, but how does the vlogging quality compare to the two Canon power shots that were announced around the same time? Well, I've got good news for you because I've filmed a completely separate video with completely separate footage comparing all three of these cameras, the RX100 Mark VII, the Canon G5X II, and the Canon G7X Mark III, all compared for vlogging, specifically indoors and outdoors. So check that one out if you're interested in using it for that application. As for this video, well, let's get on with the review. Before moving on, the Mark 7 also becomes the first RX100 model to offer a heat warning menu. At the default setting, the camera starts recording after just five minutes of 4K per clip, something which the Canons trump with their 10 minute 4K clips. If you record two or three of these five minute 4K clips on the Sony in a row, it'll typically overheat and require a few minutes of cooling. But set the heat warning to high and the Mark 7 will keep recording until it runs out of power, memory or becomes really overheated. Here's an example of it filming a single 4K clip beyond one hour in a warm room before the battery expired. Now at this point the camera was pretty hot to touch but Sony assures me it's not actually incurring any damage. It's just a case of whether you mind the body becoming hot to touch or not. If you're filming from a tripod, it's absolutely fine, and I really welcome this extending recording capability. Oh, the RX100 Mark VII will also respect video filmed vertically, allowing it to remain in this format when played on a phone, making it ideal for IGTV and other vertical platforms. This is a feature that you'll also find on the latest Canons, and I should say the G7X Mark III also allows Wi-Fi streaming direct to YouTube Live. And now, for the verdict. The Sony RX100 Mark VII builds upon the models before it to become the most capable pocket camera around, albeit also the most expensive of its rivals. 
The upgrades over the Mark VI are mostly focused around movies and action, with the video gaining more effective stabilisation, longer recording times and a microphone input, while bursts are now blackout free and enjoy Sony's latest autofocus technologies. The improved tracking, which now includes eye detection for humans and animals, is certainly nice to have and effectively turns it into a pocket A9 in terms of performance, but I don't think anybody really complained that the previous model was particularly slow or ineffective in this regard. So if you weren't to exploit these upgrades, do look out for potential discounts on the earlier Mark VI, which shares the same core features of the 8.3x zoom, pop-up viewfinder and flip touchscreen, as well as similar photo and movie quality. The movie upgrades on the Mark VII though are definitely worth having for video shooters and whether you're in front or behind the camera you'll love the long recording times, improved stabilisation and the microphone input, they really do transform its usefulness. As before it's up against tough competition from Canon's G5X Mark II and G7X Mark III which both sport 4K, flip screens and brighter lenses with ND filters while also undercutting it on price. The G5X Mark II also has a viewfinder, while the G7X Mark III has a mic input. But the Sony zooms much longer, boasts phase detect autofocus that's more confident whether you're shooting stills or video, not to mention much quicker bursts and higher frame rates for super slow motion. And it doesn't make you choose between the viewfinder and mic input, it gives you both of them. Another compelling option is Sony's own RX100 Mark V-A, which couples the shorter and brighter lens with an ND filter, with phase detect autofocus and a viewfinder, although no touchscreen or microphone input. Please Sony, can we have a special edition of the Mark V with a touchscreen and microphone input, as it would surely become the perfect vlogging camera. Ultimately though, if you're after a do-it-all pocket travel camera that's also great for video and action, the RX100 Mark VII is hard to beat. Sure, it's not cheap, but there's simply nothing else out there that offers all of this and still fits in your pocket. Right, that's it for this video. If you found any of it useful, you can reward me with a like and a follow. Don't forget to click the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of my videos. And if you really liked it, you can treat me to a coffee or treat yourself to my in-camera photography book and there's links for all of that below. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.